I thank you very much for inviting me. And um, I would like to start my talk by saying I found the poem before very interesting about the reign of reigning facts. And this is exactly what uh, text mining is trying to do, is to put some order in all those facts that are constantly reigning upon us. So the overview of my talk would be to, um, I, I assume that some people, may, of course, might have heard about text mining and natural language processing. Uh, but my background would be to motivate why we're working on text mining, why text mining would be of interest in new informatics. Then I will talk about uh, text mining tools, the types of technologies that not only us, but other people have developed to allow semantic annotation. Semantic annotation allows us to uh, create different applications, including search, and also the last application I will talk about is uh, how we can link knowledge pathways and models with the literature. In order to do that, we need to have the infrastructure. So in the middle of my talk, I will discuss about some initiatives that the community and also us have been uh, creating on integrating text mining processing and annotation. So a uh, few words about our center. NACTEM, or the National Center for Text Mining, was established in 2004. It was really funded because the biologists were very, we were very much needing text mining. So the first four years we focused on uh, providing text mining services for biologists. But very soon it, because it was clear that we need to expand to other areas like medicine and also social sciences. And currently, since 2011, we're a fully sustainable center working in different areas, but still our major focus is uh, uh, biosciences and biomedicine. I don't think I need to say much about why we need text mining. We all know that we have a tsunami of information. The types of documents we have to uh, mine and we have to extract information from are different, uh, from abstracts or medline to full papers, to clinical trials, to medical records, textbooks, monographs, but also what we call online discussions and online fora, uh, great literature, and so on. About the size of Medline, uh, from 14 million abstracts that we had in 2005, now we have more than 22 million abstracts. So the overwhelming information is uh, textual. And all this textual information is, of course, in unstructured format. So what we are doing in text mining is to render this information, which is in a structured <coughs> format, to structured information. And to be able to extract knowledge and information which is hidden and uh, into facts. So now I will talk a bit about how are the processes of what are the pipelines we are using to uh, analyze text. So if we start from a very simple sentence, uh, in a normal sentence that we have in the, full, in the literature, typically, which is unstructured, typically we go through different processes uh, of text mining. I don't mention all of those here for obvious reasons, but normally we have to find the words, to uh, find the sentences, uh, to tokenize, but also to what we call uh, to, uh, to tag. Is this a, a noun? Is this a verb? That's linguistics. But they're very, this is an important part of what we are doing to be able to understand uh, the text. Depending on the levels of sophistication and the levels of, uh, of application, we use different types of tools. The second part I have here in my pipeline is a name entity recognition. By that, we mean we have a token and we want to say, is it a gene, is it a disease, or a metabolite? So how we can automatically recognize these processes as well. And then we need to create more structure into uh, uh, these types of representations. So we use different parsing methods to be able to create, as you see here, different trees, to create syntactic structures and superimpose semantics on the syntactic. So, by following these pipelines that the whole community in natural language processing is following, we are creating, uh, taking a structured text and we create structure. In the end, 
we create different types of layers of annotations to be able to extract facts and events dealing, for instance, with negative regulation or positive regulation of phosphorylation, etc. An important part of this are the resources, and the resources are ontologies that the community is building, and these are actually the, the resources that give us the uh, semantics, and also different lexica, much more lexical representations that uh, uh, we are needed. So, as I will talk to the, towards the end of my talk about bridging pathways with text, what we are trying to do is to uh, put together literature and knowledge. Now, this type of uh, mapping is not trivial. So, in the literature, in text, we have words, we have phrases, we call them sentences and paragraphs. But in knowledge, in the knowledge domain, in biology and neuroscience, we have uh, semantic entities or diseases or brain regions. And we have what I will call, uh, we'll discuss a lot, events, which is going to be a big chunk of my talk. But events are much more interactions between those entities. And they're quite more abstract representations of what uh, a scientist understands. For example, phosphorylation or inhibition. How do we bridge those two uh, domains together? We use domain knowledge and we use repositories and databases and ontologies. But the mapping still is not trivial. So it's always context dependent, task dependent, and we need then to create this type of tools of name entity recognition, relation extraction, event extraction, uh, to be able to extract assertions and claims. So we have, as our speaker said before, a different type of paradigm right now of sharing information and knowledge. <laughs> Traditionally, we use the uh, information retrieval to extract uh, the, the documents. We use uh, different databases, but we also have uh, what we call research data and uh, information from the semantic web and text mining and natural language processing methods. All these disciplines are merging, and all these disciplines allow us to do knowledge sharing. So what is the impact of text mining? In the next part of my talk, I will take you step by step to different types of technologies, hopefully not too much in detail, to uh, show you how actually we can start by simple types of information, like discovering concepts, or with what we call them technical terms, name entities, all these, of course, methods are automatic. We can go to a step further, extracting relationships between the entities and uh, uh, events as well. For instance, in order to extract causality in text, we need to have uh, to do more to deeper representation of relationships. But also, we have methods to extract the dimensions, the views of these assertions. Uh, are these statements hypothetical? Are they negated? Have they been mentioned in this source or in another source? Are we certain about this claim? So by allowing multiple levels of semantic annotation, what we can do is create tools. We can allow or we can cluster documents, we can classify documents, we can do information access, which goes beyond index terms, and much more advanced applications, like trying to reconstruct or even construct pathways and models from the literature. So the way we are actually allowing to a rich content, we're doing by layers of semantic annotations. The first one is terms, and I will describe very briefly the tools you have developed for that. Semantic entities, relations among entities, and those are projects and uh, uh, services which are currently online, so you can have a look on our website and see how they work. Um, events and associations, uh, different systems which extract direct and indirect associations, and last, uh, uh, discourse information from text which can allow us to actually classify information into negation or not. Um, so the simplest, uh, if we think about text mining pipelines, 
into a, a different layers of sophistication, perhaps the simplest is extracting terms. But this is an important part because technical terms and concepts characterize documents semantically. So we know we're talking about a neuroscience to uh, topic or about a specific on Alzheimer's disease because the terms uh, tell us so. But when we're trying to extract terms, things are not so simple. Typically, we have to deal with what we call uh, normalization, but that is variability. Uh, so we have lots of uh, spelling variants and acronyms. They all mean the same thing. So we need methods that allow us to group these variants into the same concept. And in addition, we need to disambiguate. Very often we have, especially with acronyms, a word meaning different things in different domains, even within the same area. But also they could be referring to different species. So species disambiguation and general disambiguation is a major issue, a major challenge in natural language processing, and something that have been, the community has been working over several years. So, um, very briefly, to do the first part, term extraction, I will introduce Termine, which is a very simple term extraction service, which is available on our website. The only thing that we need to have is the part of speech tagging, which is basically recognizing if a sequence is a noun or a verb or an adjective. Then you incorporate normalization to be able to automatically extract terms. So the way it looks is if you have a text or a collection of documents, then they're highlighted, automatically highlighted as uh, what are the most important text, the terms, and then they are ranked. And by the ranking, then we can actually uh, automatically identify that this text talks about uh, a specific concept. Now, this is very important because by doing that, we can immediately use the, uh, those terms as instead of index terms. So we can do classification and clustering. The next part of actually normalization is recognizing acronyms. And here I have an example like BLA, which is uh, quite relevant to this audience, which has uh, uh, about 13 different meanings from Medline. So these have to be extracted, they have to be normalized, so you find all the different synonyms and then disambiguated. So what actually we are doing by uh, extracting uh, acronyms, uh, we are creating uh, databases, uh, dictionaries automatically, giving all the expanded forms. About uh, abbreviations are a, a, a quite a sort of well-known problem in, in biomedicine because 81% of abbreviations are ambiguous. And each amb uh, abbreviation has about 16.6 .6 different senses. So it is very important to be able to find disambiguation tools. So this is actually uh, another uh, screenshot of a disambiguation acronym uh, service we have created, which allows you, when you have a text, to find what we call the local, the acronyms that have been expanded in text, and the global, the acronyms that have not been expanded, but we need to disambiguate, providing the, the, actually the, um, the full form. So why we need these tools is they're extremely important, as I will say later, for search. So if we do query expansion, if we do query, it's very important to be able to incorporate these types of acronyms and expanded acronyms in our search. But now I'm going to something which is much more, this is the simpler things, more challenging. If we want to uh, uh, extract uh, text, we need to deal with more structured representations. And one of the major issues is if we want to extract causality from, this, from text, how do we go about it? So, again, if we start from raw text and we go through the pipeline and we see uh, the following sentences about the interaction of IL-10, we can, of course, find the name, name entities uh, that we're talking about proteins, but then the next step is to find the events. Now, I'll spend some time about the notion of event 
because this is uh, quite fundamental in the types of systems that we, not only we, but the community is building currently to try to uh, reach, combine knowledge with text. As we can see here with events, we have uh, words uh, like, for instance, induces, that this actually for a biologist could mean something like a positive regulation or phosphorylation. If we put all these things together, we want to, in the end, to say that this sentence, the first sentence, it causes the, another sentence. But to do that, we, go, we have to go beyond, uh, actually, uh, the, um, the strings in text. So, I will just spend a bit more about event extraction. If we take now uh, this another sentence about expression of Aurora B enhances phosphorylation of uh, S6, uh, S6K1, we have the first one, we have triggers, a type of event, which is gene regulation. Now, normally, we have triggers, something that tells us that this event is about expression. And what we call as theme is what actually, what is the patient, what, 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 what is caused by this event, by, by uh, gene expression. Typically, in text, we map this to what we call the subject and the object. But we cannot think about the causality as the subject and what is happening to a, a, an event, uh, to, to, to uh, an entity, as the theme. So we have this simple sentence has three different events dealing with expression, with phosphorylation, with, uh, uh, and the gene expression, and also some more complex events like positive regulation, which includes uh, a different event like gene expression and phosphorylation. So to be able to, uh, for a biologist, when we read this, talk, with this uh, sentence, we understand, people understand that people are talking about phosphorylation and expression. But what we are doing is to capture this automatically. So this is actually what I talked before, bridging knowledge with uh, the text. To do that, we have created systems, and this is something the community currently is very, the natural language processing community working in biomedicine is working actively in uh, methods and systems that automatically extract events. So automatic annotation of event in text are, can normally consist of uh, extracting the triggers, so basically the words, the phrases that characterize an event type. Typically, they're verbs or nominalizations, like inhibition. And then what we call typed arguments. Uh, what is, for instance, the causality? What is the site? So you have several arguments that are the context of this event, and then the attributes. Is this something negated? Is it speculative? And so on. So now I will talk about the tools that we have built to extract events, and some of the, I'll mention briefly, some of the challenges that the community is currently working on. Uh, typically, most systems, most successful systems right now, uh, use a pipeline of uh, methods for extracting events. And most systems are really machine learning. I don't want to go through too many of these details because perhaps it's too computational linguistic for this audience. But typically, in order to do that, we need to use uh, parse, parsing uh, results. Uh, parsing the results find us the structure, the syntactic structures, different dictionaries. and. Um, we can combine different methods to be able to achieve that. So currently, the event mind, the system we're using, is producing one of the best results for several event uh, extraction systems. Our community is also creating challenges, uh, which allows us to uh, compare and evaluate our, uh, our tools. So we're creating uh, annotated corpora, golden standards, to allow us to uh, compare and improve as well as our performance. So the event mind workflow is basically to solve uh, different types of classification in a pipeline. So normally you have a trigger or an entity detector, 
then you have to find the relationships between those uh, entities, the arguments, the semantic roles. Uh, typically, uh, an event is not binary, and that's actually the difficulty. There are different arguments. You have the location, you have sites, which have to be identified, and then what we call in hedging is the modality, if it's negated or speculated. So now, uh, really, the uh, problems that we have in event extraction, there are two. The first is actually how, if we are training our tools in one corpus, how in one domain, how can we actually uh, make it work equally well in another domain? So we're using domain adaptation techniques for that. And so another challenge we have is what we call coreference, which are very briefly introduced. So what we want to do is to use information from different resources and combine it from the community as much as possible. So, to give you an example about domain adaptation, if we have a, 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 a corpora, say for instance on infectious diseases, and another corpus on, uh, uh, I don't know, neuroscience, and we want to uh, uh, train our model in the epigenetics, what we are doing is using, we transfer information from external corpora to the new uh, domain, the genetics, using domain adaptation methods. I'm not going to discuss about stacking here, but this is all the methods and the uh, community, where this community is working currently. Coreference is a very, uh, another tricky problem. And if you look at this sentence, is uh, uh, at the bottom sentence, you have different uh, contains events of, for instance, gene expression. And it says, of the John B gene, then the expression of this gene was prolonged uh, compared to, the, to that of C uh, gene. So if we don't actually uh, identify, if we don't link of this gene to John B gene, then we will not be able to extract the event. So what I'm trying to, uh, to show here is that language and how to find in text it's not simply uh, expressed. So we need to uncover this type of information. We need to be able to link co-referring expressions between that gene it refers to, to the gene, and so on. So by combining, actually, domain adaptation and co-reference, we can then improve the systems we are creating. And normally, typically, we uh, calculate that in F-score, which is harmonic mean between precision and recall. Another problem we have, and I might go a bit quickly on that, given the time, is we want not domain adaptation is working extremely well in one domain. So you have a specific, you have a target corpus, but still you have a limited scope. So one of the challenges now to build uh, models which have a wide coverage of event extraction. So we can recognize many of these events in different domains using as many resources as possible and actually going beyond domain adaptation. So if we want to build the corpus as we're doing for training our systems, which is really wide coverage, is really impractical because it's absolutely impossible to deal with so many uh, types of semantic information. So what we have done is actually to use a combined use of different uh, corpora. I'll give you an example here. So most types of uh, uh, resources, sometimes they have a partially overlapping scope. So uh, we have events in different corpora here, corpus is um, uh, semantic annotated uh, uh, text, which have different scope. So what we are trying to do is, if we're trying just to merge this type of corpora, that we have problems. So um, here is an example. Uh, if we see here, uh, if we just merge, for instance, hypothetical corpus X, which is human P53 and NF kappa B, it has been annotated with organism and protein. And the other corpus is uh, annotates P53 as protein and NF kappa B as protein complex. If we just try to merge this type of uh, uh, corpora as they are, we can have what we call falsely created negative examples. 
So we need to find methods of uh, alleviating this problem by actually uh, unfilter the unannotated examples. So we generate basically uh, negative examples only from those which are appear as marked up as positive semantic types in text. So for instance, we know, we assume that NF kappa B will never appear as a positive example of the semantic type in this corpus, so we can filter it out. We have done the same thing for events, and without going too many details here, basically those are the problems we're trying to extract and recognize automatically events by using an partially overlapping information, semantic information, from different resources that the community is building. I'll skip the comparison because of not having much time. And uh, I would just want to spend two minutes on the meta-knowledge attachment of events. The last part in my layers of annotation was about discourse. Uh, and although it looks very linguistic, it's actually extremely important because once we have extracted, extracted statements and assertions, we want to make sure that the statement, if it's certain or if it's negated, and what actually it means, what was the uh, perception and the impression of the author, the intention actually of the author. If we go back again to the extracting information in events, uh, in, in sentences, we start looking then at different cues, linguistic cues in sentences. Like here, we have uh, showed and so it may talks about a type of analysis, but we can have an investigation, we can talk about methods. All these types of information are uh, marked up in text. We have also something like word unable. This is a negation. So this is clearly this statement tells us it's not just triples of information, but means something else. And then we have significantly. So we, we can say something with high confidence. And to our... Uh, express actually what we are doing automatically, we are taking a sentence like the one you see above and we mark it up with different types of information that this is, talks about an analysis, the type of certainty is quite high, the polarity is negative, the manner that is expressed is high, and the source is current. The author is talking research has been doing in this paper and not in previous work. But we can combine this type of information and actually we can create new knowledge and negate it. So how this actually is working, and I'll go very quickly on that, we have built search systems which take the sentences and automatically mark them up and classify them as uh, a statement which has a specific certainty level or it's negated, or it's analyzed. So we have such systems that actually are doing that. Now, why this is important, it's, I think it's extremely important because not all triples are the same. Uh, if, you, if you just say in a sentence, in a document, you need to be able to highlight this type of information and the provenance and the intention of the author. I'm going to stop now here about events. And I'm going to talk very briefly about infrastructure before I go to the search systems that we have created. Now, infrastructure is extremely important in the community. And in our, uh, one of our um, preoccupations from the beginning in the center was to create platforms, interoperable platforms that allow the community to uh, combine and share resources and tools. So in our case, we have built two infrastructures and uh, very much based on UEMA, IBM's UEMA. And this is something, again, our community is very actively uh, working on. So the two systems uh, you compare in Argo, one is uh, much more a standalone Java application and can be installed on a local uh, computer. And Argo is a web-based application, and it has lots of interactive components, and it has been used and is currently used for bio-curation. So what we are actually trying to do is to bring different tools together, allow the community to create workflows automatically from the text mining tools we have developed, and actually see the annotations and manipulate the annotations automatically. 
So again, the workflow is more or less the people know about scientific workflows, but we have also text mining workflows, which are exactly the processing pipelines I talked in the beginning. So there are different components we put together, and clearly we don't want to use uh, one of the problems we always had in the community is how you translate from a type system to another. So to avoid these type of problems, either we, we wrap those tools into a similar type system, or we have uh, tools that automatically do the translation for, uh, for you. So what we have created is actually a comprehensive biomedical text mining toolkit, toolkit which has a number of uh, corpus readers. Those are annotated corpus that allow us to evaluate different text mining tools. Uh, so all these types of annotated corpora I mentioned before. Uh, you have uh, different format readers, you have writers, and you have syntactic tools, semantic tools. Um, it's also multilingual, so we have about 200 text mining components, not only our own, but the community. So why do we need that? So as I said before, most of the um, tools, most of the um, um, analysis we are doing is task dependent. So a name entity recognizer can work extremely well in a specific uh, corpus, but then it doesn't work for your task. And you say, well, it, most people say, well, the text mining doesn't work. Well, it doesn't work for the specific versus corpus because you need to customize it and adapt it. So the way we are doing it is actually to create evaluation workflows, as we find here, to uh, evaluate the performance of different systems. So you have two name entity recognizers, and normally you evaluate them against the gold standard. So that's a one way for the community to see uh, what is, for as you see here in this example, uh, you have a text has been marked up, and you see what's the gold standard in, in red, and that how different uh, analyzers perform. But then we thought that this was not sufficient, and we created another, a much more uh, general and more um, sort of uh, uh, bigger infrastructure called Argo, which has different the processing components, taking it from Ucompare, but also uh, it has allows you to create automatically workflows, um, and. Uh, it can be actually, you can mark up once you extract your do the documents, you can do the, the processing remotely, and last, you can look actually, uh, manipulate the manual annotations. Um, it's also, uh, can be combined with different types of applications. So how this works, um, uh, it's actually the view allows you to manage your workflows, it's the main uh, view of Argo. So in this case, you can, uh, for instance, you want to find to disambiguate species, or you want to extract uh, uh, you know, documents, or finding specific name entities. The second part is actually the processes view. And once you start, uh, you run a workflow, then it tells you the progress of the different workflows that you are running. So normally, Argo automatically switches to this view uh, from the workflows view whenever you start uh, a new uh, item. And here are the different documents that have been actually uh, extracted and allow you to manage your file space. Let me, let me show you how it works. So basically, the, the, the middle panel allows you to start now manipulating, dragging components and creating workflows. So you want to find the search, you want to find uh, to use a service, as I'll, uh, I'll tell you afterwards about Clio, and then uh, you can manipulate, drag and drop different tools to create this type of canvas. Um, the automatic, uh, the workflow has automatic processing and also manual uh, correction with different search engines and different types of multi-format serialization. So you can actually uh, combine them to RDF or XMI or whatever. And we are, the important part of this is also Sparkle, which allows us actually uh, to translate between different components. So I'm going a bit quickly now because I'm a bit worried of the time. Uh, so once the system automatically 
um, uh, annotates the document, what the curators are doing are to filter and convert different annotations. So for instance, as you can see here, you can select or deselect, and you can also select a link with different ontologies, as we have done here with the Kebi, which actually allows you to see also the select specific entry and see the syntactic structure. Now, I'm a bit late. In the last 10 minutes, I'm talking about some of the services, all these text mining tools and the infrastructure has been combined to create two things, pathways and search systems. For the search systems, we have created a number of components. Uh, the first is uh, doing search based on name entities. Rather than the string, you can search on genes or proteins or diseases. And the first system I'll show you is called Clio. It's a faceted semantic search. So, for instance, if you're putting a... a actually, I cannot see here, so I don't have my specs. So, if I, for instance, my first query is ATP, um, and you have about 11,000 or 11, 13,000 uh, uh, queries, which is a lot. But if you specify here and you put gene, you have much less uh, results or documents, substantially less. Then you can start manipulating the types of facets by, for instance, putting different queries like here, you can say, for instance, I want this gene with this disease. So uh, here we chose Alzheimer's disease. You have 11 documents. And at the same time, you can even specify even more. And you might say, I want to disambiguate the species. And you have human, you have seven documents from the 13,000 documents. This simple example is actually to show you how by doing an analysis of semantic types, it can allow you to create a much more interesting and pertinent search systems. The next system uh, service, service we have provided is actually a searching semantic search based on facts. And this again uses name entity, but also uh, you can do a query. Uh, so for instance, if my query here is uh, what activates P53, you might have uh, the sentences, automatically the sentences from the documents are extracted. And you can see here that you find the snippets of information from the whole literature which is pertinent to your query. I mentioned events, so you can do the same search by going not through triples actually and activates, but through this uh, information like localization or uh, different types of biological events. In this case, the user can actually specify a higher and upper level of analysis. Localization, you can specify a TNF alpha. And again, you can automatically extract the sentences from text, uh, showing you exactly the types of information that you need. So these actually search systems allow you to really manipulate the information and find it much more pertinently. Uh, we are also working with uh, EuroPMC, creating the Evidence Finder. The Evidence Finder is actually automatically scanned based on full parsing all the text mining uh, processing tools I have expressed before to allow you to do search. And this is on full papers, about two and a half million full papers. So in this case, the system is generating questions. So you might give a very simple example, a query. The, 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 the questions are automatically generated. And if your query, if you're, for instance, like here, you click on a query, you extract the snippets of information automatically. And you can see how are actually highlighted in text. I'll just go very quickly now to show you um, all the types, actually, of association here. So all the systems. They're, they're finding what is known in text. But another a step further from that is to find what is unknown, what are the direct and the indirect associations. And the systems FACTA is doing that. So if I ask about e caterine through uh, indirect associations through a gene or another disease, 
what you find here is the element of surprise. So you don't expect to find these concepts co-occurring in the same uh, uh, document. They're co-occurring in different documents, but because A occurs with B and B with C, we make an assumption as well that A is uh, related with C. So in this case, your query, Caderine, is associated with Parkinson's disease via these specific genes. So this type of information is quite important because it allows you to visualize it because it can tell, the, tell us what is hidden. Now I'm going to uh, actually the last five minutes of my talk, why I told you all that. How did we put all those things together and why did we do all that? One of the extremely important applications is actually uh, uh, linking pathways and models with the, uh, the evidence from literature. And we all know that pathways are extremely difficult to construct it manually. We know that actually they have to uh, be maintained and they are curated manually. So all this, the items and the systems and the services and the text I told you before, the events, are put into practice to do that. So, currently, uh, PathText, the system of develop, supports SBML models. So what we are doing, if you're looking at the SBML model and you look at the reaction or a reactant and modifiers, we are automatically translating this reaction into queries. These uh, queries are calling the different text mining systems that I have just very briefly mentioned, FAT, Patreo, and Media. But the core, the fundamental part of this work is the notion of event. That's why I spent so much time talking about event. events. In order to link the evidence from the literature to text, you need to be able to extract events and, in effect, map the reactions in the pathways to what they are events which are scattered in text. And even more so, in pathways, you have very specific information about reactants and modifiers. These not, do not necessarily map in text into the same thing. So maybe a reactant, you will not find exactly the same information in text. By using the representations, as, as I very briefly tackled before, we can extract this information automatically and guess more or less what is going to be the context. So by, basically, by looking at the models, we can not only uh, extract documents based on the relevance of the reaction. So basically, your documents are extracted, how relevant are they, are they are with the specific reaction in a pathway. But at the same time, we have uh, ranked the results, we have developed different ranking mechanisms uh, to combine the information from these uh, services and provide one into one interface. Um, the, um, I don't have much time, but uh, the query generation basically is, uh, as I said, uh, based on, um, um, on, on the, the, basically on the three different types of systems. So you have each system demands different types of queries, uh, like Clio demands semantic types, and the media is like the events. So um, Again, the relevant, the ranking of the documents it is based on the types of the reactions that we have in the model. Uh, we, in order to do that, so if you have in SPML, and currently we have only in Cell Designer, uh, you have different types of reactions and reactants. These are uh, automatically, actually, we have created rules to uh, find, uh, map these uh, reactions into event representations. And this is how you're doing the querying. So just to uh, more or less finish about the ranking. So you combine, we combine different search systems that we have developed. And again, uh, this could be augmented because if you have the infrastructure, as I mentioned before, you can combine different other technologies. Each service combines different tools, but interoperability achieves that to use different tools, put them together, to be able to do that. You can use different ranking mechanisms. We use rule-based and machine learning. I think it's a detail here. But the important thing to remember is that actually there are possibilities of finding and ranking documents based on the actions and using this information actually to support 
not only the curation of pathways which are currently doing, but also to go a step further and uh, allow uh, uh, to, uh, suggestions to maintain and also augment the pathways. There is a, a web interface and it's also an API. So you have both a web-based user interface and set, uh, for programmatic uh, access. And as you can see here, if you go on our website, you can uh, select one of the pathways we have developed, we have actually included or choose your own. Uh, and you can do basically a query based on a reaction. And then you have the ranked documents, uh, you have a kind of a highlighter in blue, it's a level of confidence based on our results. Um, I think I'm going to, uh, because I don't have much time, and I'm going through that. Um, so I'd like to conclude now. A very simple conclusion is I hope um, that uh, I, I, I just demonstrated to you that text mining is an enabling technology which is used for evidence-based knowledge discovery. <laughs> Event extraction, uh, although it sounds pretty challenging, this is exactly what the community is doing right now. It's very important for the types of uh, applications that are needed in this field, in your field. And again, infrastructures are extremely important and integral part of all the bioinformatics and neuroinformatics applications. And uh, acknowledgements about our funding and the team at NACTAN. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one or two questions. So in your introduction, you mentioned that one of the applications of this technology is clustering of documents. And as a neuroscientist, I go to a conference with 30,000 attendees and at least 10,000 abstracts. When we send in those abstracts, we have to specify uh, what, what area to put them in. And I feel like I'm using concepts of the 1970s that they do this. Right. And uh, would be, how close are your technologies to allowing us to, in real time, cluster those abstracts in more interesting ways. Well, we have uh, several systems who are doing it real time, which I, I can show it to you. <laughs> so, so, so you but, give it to the society then. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but we have actually, we created um, uh, clustering methods that allow you to do it real time. So given a query, the system automatically generates semantic labels, clusters. And they're based on the termine, on technical terms. So you have to extract the terms and use different, you know, it's of course for machine learning. But you can automatically cluster the documents based on semantic labels. But you can choose. It presents semantic labels to you. So you can say, well, I want now to find the documents, zoom into the documents on this specific cluster. Let's, yeah, absolutely. We have it on our website. We've done this for clinical trials, for food security, and even for uh, Newswire. So... Uh, well, I've been doing a lot of uh, manual text mining uh, on documents that contain information about productivity. So there you find many sentences that are ambiguous. And an example is the dorsal part of area A, which is also referred to as B. And then you don't know if that B is equal to A or equal to the dorsal part of mm -hmm. A. So I was wondering if you, with your technology, can create a service that you can run this publication through preferably before they are published, to see, <laughs> to see if the publication is mineable by human or by, by algorithm. Well, that's a very interesting because it goes into the, uh, you said about uh, how we authors interact with text mining tools for authoring, basically, and scholarly communication. This is exactly what text mining uh, can do. Um, so we were talking, of course, with different people who are, uh, create authoring tools which allow you to disambiguate, suggest to you the, uh, ambi the different types of ambiguity and suggest the types of disambiguation as well. And all those tools are quite interactive because uh, uh, text mining suggests. It's the same thing with uh, associations. But then you can, really you can really suggest and choose, for example, we can link with ontologies to allow you to disambiguate, as I showed before, with the infrastructure. We link with Kebi. And then it's up to the researcher to say, well, I want this specific entry. So absolutely, uh, the technology is there to be integrated into a kind of authoring environment to allow people to do that and to actually link with other authors and other types of statements. For instance, uh, one of the things that I said before, 
about uh, uh, facts which are negated. So you're writing, for instance, your paper, and it's not only the disambiguation. You, you think that this is something that you read the paper and you say, well, I, I'm pretty certain about this. But the system can automatically say, hang on, this specific assertion has been speculated by X, Y, and Z and has been negated. What are you going to do about this? So this is exactly the types of information that are of interest, yes. One last question. So um, you and your colleagues seem to have made impressive progress, uh, but, but I'm wondering, um, it appears that this system or these systems um, are uh, highly democratic in terms of the text that they're mining, and it, that, which is to say kind of agnostic about quality. And as you get into evidence, scientific evidence, one of the concerns is that different articles have very, sometimes vastly different quality. And I'm wondering if you've made any attempt to learn quality yeah, well, that's a kind of a very interesting question. There are different types of measuring quality. First of all, quality for, it's for the text mining tools. To what extent our results uh, are actually close to what a human can do. So the performance of our systems, uh, uh, it very much depends in the machine learning based methods uh, to the types of annotations. Uh, it has to be as close to a human uh, knowledge. So we can then ascertain to what, uh, to what uh, extent our systems perform well. But the second part of your query is, how do we know the source? How do you know that this specific type of information uh, comes from a credible, uh, you know, the second part? This is actually, again, uh, it, it quite easy to do by uh, putting a, a kind of ranking based on, if, for instance, this paper is from a good journal or a bad journal. That's very that's easy to integrate in the infrastructure. So there are different types of ranking and evaluation, um, you know, um, types of certainty and levels of certainty of assertions we can incorporate by looking, for instance, at parameters like X journal, X impact factor is good, or X author has a good reputation. Those are different types of uh, uh, parameters one could introduce in a system when you're doing your ranking and classification. Absolutely. Okay, let's thank Sophia again.